Well, what's the crack? Recently, Ireland has become well known for its vibrant tech startup scene. We're beginning to punch well above our weight in producing unicorns like Stripe, Flipdish, Intercom, Wayflyer, Let's Get Checked, and many more. But the same cannot be said when it comes to Ireland's crypto scene, and I have no idea why we are lacking here. So to help figure this out, I've asked one of Ireland's top venture capitalists, Finn Murphy, to explain to us what's going on. By day, Finn is a lead partner at the renowned Frontline Ventures. And by night, he has also recently become a co-founder of the innovative NFT project PFPID, which is aiming to solve the complex problem of digital identity. Finn has co-founded PFPID with the team of young hotshot Irish developers, Nev Flynn and Connor Deegan. PFPID is not a pump and dump. You will not get rich from owning one of these. This is an ambitious utility product. But I have a sneaking suspicion that just by following this team and the directions that they are going in, it will pay dividends in itself. So check out the timestamps below and skip to the sections of this wide ranging discussion that you are most interested in. I've been in the Irish venture scene for four years. I've been in the kind of like general Irish tech scene for probably about 10, like beyond that. So like trying to do my own startups, trying to like being involved in accelerators, being involved in what's going on. So like, I think where that came from is primarily like, I just got into, you know, I, when I got into college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And tech seemed to be like, it was, there were more and more people going into it. Web Summit was happening. Like the social network came out. Like everyone was using apps, like the iPhone, iPhone usage exploded. And it's like, okay, this is probably like an interesting industry to spend more of my time. And I think because of that, like, I've like I've been in that Irish tech scene for about 10 years so like I got to know people and like you know you meet someone once for a coffee one year and then the next year and then the next year and suddenly you're four years in and I kind of feel like I like I'm definitely sort of part of the furniture when it comes to like Dublin tech scene just also because like it's a relatively young like the last 10 years is kind of like almost half of the time it was even there and before then like still a lot of the best entrepreneurs like the intercom founders would go to the US and go to San Francisco. Um, so like my journey came to end up in VC was through starting my own company, then working at another company and then that company kind of winding down and me thinking, they're thinking about starting another business and then actually saying, it's like, well, actually maybe I should just go get paid and work for someone else for a little while. Uh, and that led me to an open job at Frontline four years ago and I thought I would only do the job for about a year, 18 months. And now, like, here I am four years in. Um, and I think, like, even in that four years, like, a lot has changed in the Irish tech scene. Like, like everything's just got bigger, like, more and more. I feel if you're in Dublin in particular, like, more and more people just work in tech or are tech adjacent. Like, there's more and more Irish tech companies that people want to go work for. Like, be it, there used to just really be Intercom, now there's Times, now there's Wayflyer, there's Let's Get Checked, there's Flipdish, there's, like, now in Cork, there's, like, Work Vivo, there's Akiro, and in Dublin, like, like, even there's Bright Flag, Box Ever. Like, there's a ton of really interesting businesses that you can go work for. I mean, I think, like, the pipeline to, like, the venture capital industry, at least how I think it, like, probably best works is, like, people who are, like, tech adjacent, so either founders or working at startups, are sort of like the natural pipeline and progression for them can be to go and become investors. But like that, that ecosystem, like it also hasn't developed by itself. Like there's been a huge amount of work put in by like people like Patrick Walsh and Menno at Dogpatch. Now like Philip Reynolds, like turning Dogpatch into the NDRC National Accelerator. Like even the team at like Huckle Tree, like it, it's really like there's so many different people that have done so much to tr make that an ecosystem. Mm. And it's kind of at the tipping point of like big companies, enough people that, you know, it like it used to be, you could know, like, and maybe that's it, it, when I started, like you could know everyone in Irish tech in probably like three months. Now that's probably a lot harder. So I think that's the, that's the kind of, that's what I've seen in the ecosystem. And that's kind of how I ended up getting to where I am now. You, you mentioned Dogpatch. And and I, I see dog patch advertised everywhere. I, I I've never been in there or anything like that. But I've always wondered, you know, is 
are, are VCs just praying around dog patch and, you know, like do you have a line in to Paddy Walsh and you're just like, you know, what's hot, what's not like, like, is there an element, how, how, how do you source your, the, the companies that you're investing in? Yeah. Like I probably like, how do we sort like, it's probably two questions there. It's like, where do people congregate? Where do good founders congregate? And then how do you go and find them? And like, yeah, Dogpatch is a great place. Like there's founders coming in and out through the accelerator programs. There's people who are working from there. There's people who are tech adjacent as well. Like there's advisors, execs, people at other companies who then know founders who may not even be in Dogpatch. Yeah. So like there's an element of like, if you just look in one place, you're not going to find interesting people working on interesting things. But, you know, they're more likely, they are more likely to congregate there. So I think, like, places like Dogpatch have been great for just, like, a founder meetup where you can go and meet a bunch of people doing similar, like, you know, trying the same stuff, doing similar things to you. Um, but, like, in terms of VCs praying around there, like, it's, like, by the time you meet someone in Dogpatch, like, they've already, they should at least have already met several VCs. So like where you end up actually finding things are like a lot of it's network driven. So mm. it's like you spend all day on WhatsApp, you spend all day meeting people, you do lunches, you do dinners, you like just help people out with no expectation of anything in return. Yeah. Because one day those people might let you know about their friend who's doing something, you know, who started an interesting business and is doing something cool. Yeah. And so the type of business that Frontline are going for is... You know, there. I, it it. It's it's all SaaS, or you know, is is it has have, have the types of companies you're investing in over the last few years changed in relation to uh, the market is changing? Like, are are you starting to look at, you know, instead of fintech, more DeFi companies or or projects or anything like that? Yeah, like I actually just had a conversation about this earlier. Like, like the problem is, it's very hard to judge when you're early and when you're late. It's usually early. It's easier to say you're early, um, but then it's the time horizon of like, what if you're too early? Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I when I started venture four years ago, I'd been a product like I'd been doing product management and growth marketing at a consumer fintech, and to be honest, like all the fintech tools, I was like, like fintech is playing itself out. It's like the winners were already crowned. Like the tools are kind of there, but they're kind of shitty. Like, I don't know why this, like, a version where I was like, oh, fintech is kind of over. And, like, fintech was, like, not over. If I had been decided at that point to be Mr. Fintech, I'd probably have a pretty written portfolio right now. Um, so I think there's definitely, people are always, like, curious and looking at new industries. So, like, DeFi is definitely one. Like, DeFi is one. Um, like, kind of applied, applied artificial intelligence. Like, even, like, software in the biotech world. Like there's always like people pushing up against the edge in the investing world, mm. and like crypto being no exception. But I think there's always you can sometimes have an exuberance towards something new and shiny, and then kind of forget to see the wood from the trees and know that you know, actually there's still a ton of problems and a ton of value to be created solving yeah. existing problems with existing technology. You know that kind of brings us into to the you know that so frontline and VC is your day job but by all accounts at nighttime you moonlight um in a DAO uh pfp id uh you know from looking at it it's not a sexy project but you know it's to anyone who who wants to learn about the philosophy of or the 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 reasoning behind crypto you know it's a very important one and something that might get overlooked until the time comes until it's needed so why don't you tell us what is PFPID? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So PFPID came from a pretty straightforward, like, realization. Um, so, like, I think most new products require, um, like, either a total change in behavior, like, by an end user or an opening by an existing network or product to slot yourself into. So when I saw Twitter had basically like enabled NFT profile pictures, I was like, okay, that's pretty interesting. Like, what's that going to enable? Like, okay, it shows that within a graph of people who know that you're you, you can now show off that you own something cool. 
So like you've already put all this time into having these 10,000 followers and now you can let your 10,000 followers know that you own a board ape. And I was like, great. But like, wouldn't it be more interesting if in, even if you hadn't been verified, you could let your followers know that you actually were you and that was actually your account. And that was kind of where the genesis for BFP ID came from was the idea that as more and more internet platforms embed different aspects of Web3 into their products, like one of the key things that like the internet people have tried to solve on the internet for a really long time is identity. So like who's who, you know, the old adage was like, nobody knows you're a dog on the internet or like nobody knows that like, you know, 16 year old you're talking to is actually a 54 year old man in Wisconsin. Like, you know, this is, these are the kind of things that we were like, how do you solve for that? And I think one of the things that came up with PFP was you can do it in a pretty straightforward way with modern NFTs where you just, the wallet is like, at least in my our view, is like the wallet is like the computer effectively that you use to browse Web3. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's going to be how you interact with the different chains. It's going to be where you keep most of your files and most of your accreditation. And then what can you put in the wallet or what attribute can you put in the wallet that allows you to identify as yourself? And that was where we came up with the idea to say, well, let's use modern KYC technologies and proof of identity technologies to allow people to verify that they've gone through that proof of identity transaction, uploaded a picture of themselves that they like. We match the picture of themselves that they like to the uploaded picture in the proof of identity set and then mint a non-transferable NFT into that wallet. So effectively saying it's like, well, that wallet is your wallet. Mm. And that's confirmed from now, you know, and that's yours until you decide to mint it in another one. Mm. Um, and that's really, that was from like the genesis to where we came to now and how we got to PFP ID. Yeah. So it, it, on the face of it, it goes against a lot of what you, crypto is about at the moment, and which is pseudonymity. Um, and I'm sure you've watched uh, the famous uh, lecture from Balaji and, you know, the pseudonymous mm. economy. And, you know, the, the example I like to give on that is recently, before Christmas on, on, on this podcast, I had Scoopy Truples on, who's the founder of Alchemix, and he identifies as a witch. And, you know, he's, he's always a witch. Nobody knows who he is, but everyone knows that he's Scoopy Truples and his pseudonymous name follows him around and he, he has, um, you know, s status on, with, with that name. But what you guys are saying is that, Okay, you can now prove that your your real name, your fiat name, for want of a better word, uh, and we can give you an, an a non transferable NFT for that. A lot of people will say that's not needed. It goes against what crypto is about. But what, where do you see this slotting in in years to come or months to come? Yeah, I, I think this is like a really healthy debate, and like you know, you can take both sides of it. Um, I like. The idea that pseudonymity and anonymity are a new thing is like a very like flawed concept. Like the first round of internet browsers, nobody was themselves. Everyone had a pseudonym because like you didn't want to let people know that you were using this weird thing called the internet and you didn't want these weird people on the internet to know who you were. Mm. This has played out like that Palaji speed talk of like the pseudo anonymous economy. Like we've had that before and we still have it. Like most people are pseudonymous on Reddit. Most people are pseudonymous on Xbox Live or PlayStation. Like it, it's not a new concept. The problem is it doesn't, like it's limiting in a lot of ways, which is why like you didn't really, there were different levels of utility based on different types of kind of medium that people interact with. So like in a Reddit format, I'll use this as an example, like Reddit versus Facebook. Yeah. The utility in Reddit, is not that I know who that person is. It's that that person posts funny content or that that person posts interesting content. If I happen to know who they are, great. On the flip side, if I'm in a Facebook situation, the whole thing is who is that person? Who are their friends? Who do they know? Because it's a connection between your internet self and your real world. Yeah. And 
what we kind of believe and where the place for PFPID is going to sit is there's always going to be pseudo-anonymity online. There's always going to be people who are like, I have clout as, you know, like Kobe. Like, that's my vibe. This is who I'm going to be. This is who I'm going to be. And like, people close to him know who he is, but I'm sure there's a whole lot of people who have no idea who he is as well. But then there's also going to be a subset of people and a subset of activities that you, like, it's just so much more straightforward to trade, like do business with people when you know who they actually are. Yeah. Because right now, like legally and in a lot of social structures, at least in the real world, like people might introduce themselves as could be triples. I'm like, okay, cool. But like, who are you? Yeah. And like, I think that that's where this like separation of, a bridge between the real world and the metaverse and like being able to connect yourself but being able to connect yourself between them and the wallet acting as that kind of connecting point that's where we see sort of the pfp id and the place for it talk to me about your kyc process so if i'm signing up to um pfp id i'm giving my details um i'm nick delhanty here's my passport utility bill and do you guys keep that? Are you now the holders of all this KYC information? No, so we we use a we use a third party KYC provider that doesn't store the data long term. So basically yeah. it's a pass through. So you upload, we don't ask for proof of address. So okay. we ask for a we ask for a government issued ID, we ask for a liveness test, we move back and forth. We then ask you to upload a profile picture that you like. And the system matches the three, your facial, like basically just facial recognition between the ID, the liveness test, and the profile picture. And that's the verification that we use. The data that you provide us, so some of it's sort of, so the picture that you upload and your name are stored on chain in clear text. And then everything else is stored in the NFT encrypted in IPFS. And so what ends up happening is like, you get to store and you get to control all of the associated data with your PFP ID. Mm. So if you want to interact with another service that say wants your date of birth, you can, if you're using your wallet, there'll be an API available that is attached to the NFT PFP ID that when you hit a service, they can query it and you will have the prompt saying, do you want to share your encrypted information with this service? that you kind of have control over. Mm -hmm. So our view is like in that KYC process is, yes, you need to go through a third party provider to scan the document, recognize the document, recognize the face, recognize the liveness test, recognize the person. But after that, it's all of that data is embedded within your NFT. Um, so it's your ID, it's your KYC, and it's kind of your like prerogative to do with it, what, you know, which wallet you put it in and what you decide to do with it. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see, you know, with, the, with all the talk of CBDCs, things going mainstream, if, if I want to set up a direct debit for my gym using crypto, you know, all, the more legitimate and mainstream crypto goes, the, the more there is a need for, yeah, we need to deal with your real identity. So I, I see it um, running adjacent to maybe the, the wallet I'm, I currently use. Maybe I'd set up a new wallet and, and have this in it for wh whatever um, reasons. So it, it is an interesting one. And what, what I like about this is that it's not a money grab. There's no, oh, these, these you're not out here is like, oh, buy this right now. This is like, oh no, we're building this because it, this is useful. This will be needed. Uh, this is not an NFT project. It's not going to be worth millions. So talk to me about the, the team behind it and the minting process and what's coming up. Yeah, so the team behind it's myself, a uh, good friend and good friends of mine, Connor Deegan and Nev Flynn. So Connor and Nev have been working together for a while. They previously had a startup called Recruit that was kind of like TikTok for recruitment videos. Uh, Connor was the CTO and Nev was leading product there. Yeah, what um, happened to that? I, I saw someone mention that on the Discord. It seems like yeah. a brilliant idea. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a brilliant idea. The guys just got caught in like, it's very hard to get repeatable sales in those. You have a lot of churn in like younger people as they're applying for jobs. Like say Starbucks was like an example customer of theirs. 
And like they did Techstar, it's like the company was going well. They had a few really good pilot customers, but it was just like caught. It's it's a hard, you know, when you're selling a product that suits that basically serves like more service related industries and like lower about like lower kind of salary industries. Yeah. It's hard to charge software like product margins for it. Mm. So like recruit was, but I think like the guys they had like they learned a ton. They'd been through like the whole founder journey, and then myself Connor uh, decided to do it myself. And Connor had been hacking away on a few different crypto projects, um, and we decided we last we basically decided. Well, he decided last summer to do a master's in computer science. And we were working away on a few things. And then obviously this January came around and we decided to say, we had the idea for PFP ID. And we decided to say, hey, Nev, like, would you be interested in getting involved and actually working on this? And Nev was, uh, he's currently at Evervault uh, doing front-end engineering and design. And he's basically, which Evervault is an encryption company for anyone who doesn't know. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the background, like three of the guys are based in Dublin at the moment. I'm back and forth, uh, in Dublin, kind of London, New York, but we're like, we're pretty solid, like, pretty solid. I think in terms of like covering the bases, like between the solidity engineering from Connor, the design and front end engineering from Nev and, and kind of my talking shop mm -hmm. and, uh, just kind of trying to keep the ideas generate, kind of keep ideas generating and get us connected up to people. We sort of sit as a good sort of trio for pushing it forward. Is, are you working closely with any other DAOs or is there any uh, uh, plan to, you know, you know, on, you get, get other projects using this uh, product? Yeah, no, hundred percent. So like we've spoken to, like we've spoken to people at the larger, like exchanges, like future NFT marketplace, NFT marketplaces. We're starting to speak to some of the DAOs. Like in reality, I think it's like going to be, you know, it's like you said, we're not trying to sell out on day one. I, I'll talk about the mint in a little bit, but like this is a utility project. The goal is to allow people to get more out of their wallets. It's to bring more people into crypto. And I think that will, that means we're happy on it being a bit more, but like we, our goal was to get something out and something in front of people, because I think until you have it in your wallet and you see the process, it's hard to even conceptualize what you might do with it. Hmm. So the plan is we're doing the mint date. So the discord is live now, the website's live now at pfpid.xyz. And, you know, our plan is the next Thursday, the mint goes live for the early joiners in the discord uh they'll all get there's like a artist at, at nev has designed this amazing like randomly generated art pro, like tool for putting in the back of every pfp id so everyone is unique and then also for the first thousand people who sign up they'll get a gold pfp id that'll be very hard to get after any point after the initial mint and there'll also be a rarer black pfp id that people will kind of have to, like, we're going to release kind of ways that how the community can get involved there. But again, it's not that the the rareness is like, so you can make money. It's just like a nice gimme to the community. Yep. And once we have them out, then the plan is like really start talking to a lot more DAOs, a lot more projects and see like, you know, what do they, where do they see identity? Like, what are their problems? You know, one of the things is like people being impersonated in the DAO. Another is like, you know, whitelists, like how do you stop people multi-accounting? Now, you know, these are the kind of things that are coming up so far that we think are really interesting, but we think until there's a product in people's hands, uh, it's hard to kind of get them on board. Yeah. And just a, a thought, where can you, can, can you issue a PFP ID to, to someone's uh, pseudonymous profile? Or does that cross over to what ENS is? So you can have like, you can have, I wouldn't, if you have a pseudonymous wallet that you that is linked to your pseudonymous identity online, Yeah, I would not mint your PFP ID to it because you'll effectively dox yourself. <laughs> like, yeah, like, you know, 
like and like there's like i think it's like if you want to dox yourself power to you but like you know i'm like i'll have a wallet that is my wallet that's like here's finn's wallet you know that belongs to finn like i have an ens that people don't know you know i have a pseudonymous ens um but like you will like there's we have a kind of longer term vision to allow people to mint a pfp id that doesn't have any on-chain unencrypted data that you would use either the encryption standard that we're using or a zero knowledge proof to be able to have people just val validate that that person is a real person and that person isn't a duplicate of someone else um but that's kind of a little bit further down the line to allow people to preserve pseudo anonymity and like or anonymity while also being able to validate and like give the trust and transparency to others that they are who they say they are mm. yeah it's uh it it's it's definitely something that as i said we, you know as as adoption grows as things go mainstream um once a wallet becomes easier to use and things like that it's something that is just obvious and especially when you when people talk about the DeFi mullet, fintech in the front, DeFi in the back, you know, mm -hmm. your fintech, your Revolut account, you know, is your real name. And how does that, you know, how, how do they meet? So, you know, you're in there somewhere. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I don't want to like say it explicitly, but like there is almost no world long term where people are able to engage in a lot of DeFi, like, you know, large scale DeFi activities without anti-money laundering and KYC mm -hmm. actions coming in. Like, it's just very hard to see how that is sustainable long-term. Um, so like, I would like to, I think, preserve as much of the an anonymity within DeFi as possible. And I think if the community aren't forward thinking on how you do enable, like, you know, again, like, if you're in a lot of DeFi groups, like how many double account, like how many people are double accounting, how many people are bots, how do you actually know who's interacting with who? Like, I think there's a lot of challenges around identity that are going to have to be solved long term. Mm. Um, and like you say, if it's fintech world, like if you're touching the banking rails, like they will know who you are. Like there's no there's no two ways about it. Yeah. Um, so it's figuring out if you want to, you know, how close do you want to get to those rails? And I think if you want to get close to them, something like a PFP ID can be that bridge to, you know, again, help you with the DeFi mullet, like FinTech in the front. We're effectively FinTech in the front with the KYC, DeFi in the back with the NFT. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we're right. I, I didn't think of us as writing that trend, but I'm happy to now put us in that pocket. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, so uh, the 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 mint. So the, uh, from what I know, it's, it's coming next week. Uh, mm. How much is it? Where where is the mint happening? Um, how much will, will will gas fees be affected? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've like we're basically the mint's going to go live next Thursday. So this weekend, uh, a bunch of the if you're in the Discord. A bunch of people are going to get a chance to kind of pre-mint uh so it'll be a pre-mint on the cards and then you'll get your kind of artwork reveal uh when the mint goes live on thursday but you know i think what we've ended up in terms of gas fees like it's very hard to give an exact prediction just because of how the yeah. network is working but the idea is keep gas fees low and then like effectively the project is like we're charging a small minting fee to like the minting fee we're just hammering it out at the moment based on the gas fees, but that minting fee will kind of cover all of the operational cost and investment in more basically resources for PFP ID yeah. and actually continuing to build more functionality are, for the users. Are PFP holders uh, members of the DAO? So, you know, if you guys get mm -hmm. investment or, you know, is, is, is the, are, are, when, when you mint an, one of these, like, mm -hmm. what, what are you holding? What's your, what's your incentive in this DAO? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So that's like, we kind of wanted to do it sequentially. So like, how do you launch, once you have a PFP ID, can you like, are those early members? Do we track, do we track who they are? Do we know who they are? Are we going to be able to reward them? Like, absolutely. 
we didn't want to launch a DAO at the same time because I think if you're launching a DAO, you really want to get it right. Okay. Um, but like our view is again for the most like it's the same as the incentive structure across any Web three community. Like the early community members who are engaged the most are going to be in positions. If you were to launch a token, if you were to like create the DAO, if you were to raise outside capital from investors that everyone in the community would end up being rewarded through both an air, like token airdrop and or otherwise. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, you know, it sounds interesting. I'll definitely be minting my PFP ID um, uh, next week. So just mm. zooming out a bit and, uh, you know, crypto generally, it's interesting to, you know, have you on the channel as a VC, you know, do you see Frontline going down, um, a crypto route, you know, some of the American VCs are incredibly aggressive. <laughs> it just seems like they're just pushing and pushing and pushing, hoping that something will stick. What are your thoughts on the current space from, from that side of things? Yeah, I think from the venture side, like it's interesting. So we've done a couple of DeFi investments. So like I'd say we've done a couple of DeFi, we've done a couple of Web3 generally. Like I don't know if you know Rory Hughes at Noble, um, which is like a tool for DAOs. We've invested in a company called TAC that's doing tax management for different exchanges. We've invested in a company called Violet Protocol that's doing identity, but more institutional identity for kind of on-chain lending. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think what we've seen in crypto and particularly from the fund side is like, there's a lot of people who don't want to miss the boat. So there's a lot of investors who put a lot of money into different funds. And you kind of need to have this overinvestment and like overinvestment is going to create waste and there's going to be some bad ideas that are going to get funded. But the spillover of that is more and more people are interested in the space mm. because like, I think we're still really looking for like the use cases for crypto outside of things like mechanism of value transfer, value store, speculative asset like it's there we're like at the edges of those and we're starting to see other things but it's still not quite there <laughs> like you know even the like the big businesses like infura and alchemy are infrastructure for people building speculative games and financial you know and doing financial engineering so i think those are the things where i wonder you know i kind of sit back and i wonder and i see the other investors pumping money in and there's investors pumping money in because they want to see new interesting things built in the space. Then there's investors pumping money in because they know there's a fuck ton of money to be made because it is a speculative game and it is on regulated securities. Mm -hmm. And generally there's a premium for trading in regulated securities. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I see it from my side. Like, I think everyone's going to keep investing. Nobody wants to miss the boat. Nobody wants to miss the next alchemy, but you know, what does that look like? You know, even like the likes of MoonPay, like nobody wants to be like, oh my God, that went from like zero to 3 billion in like two years. You're an investor and you didn't at least, you're not keeping your eye out for that. You're, mm. kind of missing the, you're kind of missing the ball. Yeah. And so from an Irish perspective, you guys are probably one of the first Irish teams I've seen building, you know, something in crypto. It, Am I right in saying that there's been a slow uptake from Ireland? Why do you think that is? And, you know, are you seeing that change now? Yeah, I, I think um, there's no shortage of technical talent in Ireland. Um, there is a little bit of an apprehension towards doing weird shit, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, you know, like people are like, you should go get a job at Accenture. That sounds good. Yeah. Or like, would you be, you know, would you be an architect? Like, that sounds good. Like, I think there's like the reason why you get such talent density in places like New York and San Francisco is like, there's just, and even London and Berlin and Paris now is like, there's more edge to it because if there's a whole bunch of other people doing weird shit, like it's not weird shit anymore. It's what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So I think that's the challenge, what we've seen in Ireland, like, why would you start a crypto company when you're the only person doing a crypto company? Because like you look like a weirdo and people are like, are you trying to scam me? Um, well, you know, if you're in a group of people in San Francisco or Miami or whatever, 
people aren't being like you're trying to scam me people are like unreal sounds great <laughs> so i think that's the there have been people in the space like laurie kyo who's a consensus who's now coinbase we like you know been yeah. pushing things forward i think blockchain ireland week is going to be interesting uh at the end of may like there's a couple of good initiatives happening yeah but like it's gonna take it's gonna take time and it's gonna take a bunch of people all just deciding that this is they want this is what they want to do to actually to actually be able to break in yeah i i've i've reached out to lori on twitter but he, he kind of ghosted me um so I, I want to get him on the channel because he's someone that uh you know has he's, he's not he's, he's very high up but he's also created blockchain ireland and on my channel on this channel I've had I've had six or seven very prominent Irish people within crypto on it, and you know, to, under blockchain Ireland or whatever, there needs to be some sort of place where where ideas are shared or people, you know, some sort of social aspect to it, um, because it's you know it's it's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it over it's over pints. That's all people are saying. They're talking about NFTs. They're talking about crypto. They want to know what it's about. They don't understand it. You know, they don't know anyone who, who reliable information because th th there's nothing about it in, in the papers. All, all, all people get is sponsorships from celebrities or premiership teams or whatever. And 99% of the times, 99% of the time, those are the projects that are scams. You mm -hmm. know, so, you know, when David Williams gets interviewed about crypto, because he's an economist, he gets rolled out with crypto, but he, he you know, he doesn't really... He's not on Discord looking at DAOs. He doesn't really know. He's, he's talking about the scams. So, mm -hmm. you know, crypto has a huge prob problem in that. And in, I don't think it's going to go away fast. I think, it's, I think people are going to get scammed. Like I, I was just saying to you just before, the Liverpool are, are bringing out their own NFTs. Man United are sponsored by Tezos uh tom brady has his own nfts they're all they're all money grabs like there's nothing there's no, no two ways about that um so you know with all that in mind you know what areas of crypto are seen to be legitimate what what are your thoughts on uh game fi and play to earn yeah i i think the, the i i think game fi and play to earn are interesting the funny thing is it runs contrary to what most gamers actually want like is. like it, the idea is ownership but like often ownership is like it's still the games company selling you the nfts like <laughs> they're gonna write the contracts to give themselves perpetual royalties on all your stuff like if you think activision aren't gonna make more money by selling count combat skins as an nft you're a mug like that's gonna you know that's how these businesses like those businesses are much more sophisticated and smarter than the end users that are playing the games yeah. no offense to the end users playing the games but like i'm that end user and activision are very good at getting money out of me <laughs> so i think that it's like the use cases are interesting play to earn will work provided the game itself is really good um like because some like someone has to pay this is yeah. the kind of thing in the economics like axes people are more and more people came in and that created the function of increasing the value of the token which increased more people coming in to play to earn but like it was all funneled by more numbers of people yeah. as opposed to actual like people getting enjoyment out of the game to pay for it and people getting enjoyment people earning by facilitating that person's enjoyment um so you know i think that it's like those games there are going to be really interesting applications to play to earn mm -hmm. i just feel like we're not quite like the games aren't good enough yet yeah like and it's partly down to blockchain technology limitations like you know someone's like oh i'm going to build the distributed instagram and like the problem with building distributed instagram is like instagram has like billions of transactions every hour that are all being processed like every like every comment every view every you know if you think about the amount of transactions that happen if you think about them as transactions like their data logging points that are all part of the fabric that make up a social network if you want a blockchain that can operate at that kind of efficiency like there is none at the moment mm. uh and i think we're gonna have to see big 
increase like big improvements in blockchain technology still and we're gonna have to see big like just more creative thinking from a lot of gaming like game designers in order to kind of implement those things in a way that make a lot of sense yeah the the game that i talk about a lot on this channel uh is alluvium which is you know one of the headline uh triple a games that's in the making and you know it's it, it's it's going to be uh you know nft based all that but it's still just built on the unreal engine and you're like you know there is all these centralized points there's so many contradictions to everything uh but we're again we're just pressing all in, the, in this way to see if if it works mm -hmm. but to work with the full philosophy of decentralization you know to use way and you know your point there on all these you know decentralized instagram where do you sit on you know the the use case for solana or or you know will will you you know will cert certain chains do certain things like social media and will they all be end up as roll-ups on ethereum it's interesting i don't think everything will end up as a roll-up on ethereum like i think there is room for multi-chain like there's definitely room for multi-chain worlds mm -hmm. um i think the benefit is that like like gas prices are just like truly bananas like and the average consumer as a concept in computing like you know most people don't know this but like like if you, pa if you need to patch a smart contract you have to pay to patch your code like the, you know these like concepts are like it's like oh great i can now update the database by paying 60 dollars like you know I, I think a lot of the concepts around ethereum like they're gonna have to figure out how 2.0 actually works mm. they're gonna have to improve transaction speeds they're gonna have to reduce gas speeds like all of that has to happen but like i think if this world is either crypto is going to be a thing and they're going to fix it or crypto is not going to be a thing like you know <laughs> like i'm not saying like because even though solana is way more efficient than ethereum and faster it's still nowhere near a fraction as efficient as like a like a NoSQL database. Like it's that's that's where I think is the interesting side of crypto yeah. and where the crossover has happened. Like, does Ethereum remain the dominant chain for application building? I think so. Can Solana be a good side chain? Can Polygon? You know, there will be all of these side chains. Is Flow going to exist? Yeah, but like these things have to last for a long time and they need a lot of people active on them to make them work because all of them have like a very long way to go before they're kind of ready for like really at scale application use. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, that's what gets lost when, when, when the mania, you know, when you're in mania mode, the, all those conversations are just thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you're in a bear market, it's like, okay, well, what's the best tech or, you know, the, everyone's now focused on actual you know the merge or whatever because that's the root of, of of everything let's say um you know things get lost but yeah that is the interesting side of it and listening to the ctos of all these projects is the only they're the only people to listen to if if you if you want to invest for the long term um so listen i, I know you have to go now in a few minutes mm -hmm. but uh i'll just ask you uh for the next year in terms of investing whether it's crypto or otherwise is there any advice or 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 narratives or anything like that you you'd like to to give yeah um i think you like we're in like in a world of extreme volatility um so if you're in like i i just don't recommend day trading at the moment <laughs> like because like it's you know it's just like you can be up 20 percent one day and down 20 percent the next day and up 15 percent the next day um so like i kind of always say in terms of investing like what we do is like in venture it's pretty in, like good because we can't sell we're buying private company like illiquid assets and that means if you buy a bad company tough shit, hang on to it but maybe it'll become good and if you buy a good company you're not going to sell it because you can't um and like i think what people it's very hard to like mo it's like this this idea like most people are trying to be sp smart when the real trick in investing is not to be stupid and just don't i think if i'm putting money into anything it's like what do you i hate this is the most common advice ever but like pick 
the top 10 companies or chains that you really believe in, take your money, split it 10 ways between all of them. It's not even that diversified, but like if you want to, if you're younger and you want a more concentrated portfolio, like that's what I would do. Uh, that is kind of what I do. Um, and I think that way, at least you learn about the 10 things you put your money into. And at the end of the day, you come out on a bit like at the end of the day, if you're wrong, you know why you're wrong, as opposed to being wrong because you were stupid. Yeah. And we're just like, oh, I have to sell my position because I'm down 20%. Uh, yeah. That's far too sensible, though. <laughs> oh, you want like a YOLO thing? I didn't know. We, we were, didn't yeah, know. Uh, yeah. But, you know, you, you, we're not going to be millionaires on that. Uh, um, <laughs> I, mean, leave, but I like that quote don't be stupid um, I like that uh, no, I mean if you want to YOLO into something like be my guest but I don't know what it is I don't I know do, what it's going to be this I year do I. Um, so anyway uh, last question something I ask everyone um, give us your thoughts on price prediction for Bitcoin in the next five years where will it be in five years um, that's a good question I see all the all the money flows that we're going to go into Bitcoin have kind of gone in. Like yeah. there needs to be some kind of step change in money flows to see the price action go. Like I, I think there's a lot of price stability in the range, like you know, plus or minus twenty five percent at the moment. But yeah, I, I this sense. I think a lot of assets are going to be pretty static for the next three, four, five years. It's going to be new and novel technologies that have big upside and big growth. Hmm. Now, I think for income, like incumbents the size of Bitcoin, like you know, adding an incremental twenty percent is adding like more than the entire market cap of like all the L one, all the non ETH Solana L ones. Like you know. There's just yeah. not that much capital flow out there, and there's going to be more capital flows driven out to different parts of DeFi, different stable coins. So yeah, I, I think it's unlikely to go higher than a hundred grand in five years. It's unlikely to be higher than a hundred grand, and it's unlikely to be lower than twenty five grand. But yeah. that's a pretty big range. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it, it is hard to you know where's the next money going to come from. There's there's some stat today on Twitter that one in every 160 Bitcoin are owned by MicroStrategy. And you're just like, <laughs> he's, he's, and he's taking loans out against his own holding to buy it. And you're just like, oh, Jesus, this, this could come cascading down pretty quickly. And then you mix in the yeah. tether fraud or whatever, you know, it could be anything. Yeah. And, and like government, the idea is like, would central banks start to hold it? And the problem is central banks are just going to launch their own, if they're going to hold anything, they're yeah. going to hold their own crypto. Yeah. Uh, and then do you see more outflows from Bitcoin? So yeah, I think it's like the question is always like, where are the inflows, where are the outflows? And like, if anything, it's like I'm on the, it'll be closer to 25 than it'll be to 100, just because of the price pressure that you end up having in that in the outflows of particularly like long term Bitcoin holders. Yeah, oh, interesting. Um, well, listen, thanks a million for taking the time. Um, be in touch. Uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, no, definitely. It was really nice to meet you, Nick. I'll chat to you soon. Good luck. Bye-bye.